Today, as we head into the holy week of Bascha, the Passover week, where the Lord gave himself for us, many people begin to ask around this time and a little bit earlier, how do we stay in the moment? We consider this one of the holiest, important times of the year. And unfortunately, many of us have to work and go to school. And it's hard to sort of escape and give ourselves fully to the week. As I was reading the gospel of this morning, today, although we're praying the Vespers for the feast of the Lord's entry into Jerusalem, this today, Saturday, is called in all Orthodox churches throughout the world, Lazarus Saturday. And in it, we commemorate the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And in that gospel, you see the answer to the question of how do I make sure that I'm focused up here and not down here? The first step, this interesting verse. They told Christ that Lazarus was sick. He's the brother of Mary and Martha, very specifically named which is not the case in most of the other miracles. They clearly were special to the Lord Christ and special, obviously, to the disciples because in naming them, you're assuming that the people that will read this gospel will know who these people are. But when he was told that they were sick, or that Lazarus was sick, I'm sorry, Jesus heard that. He said, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And then the gospel goes on to say, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when that he heard that he was sick, and when you read this, like as I'm reading it to you, expect that he's going to get ready very quickly and go. So it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister La and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The first lesson of living with Christ up there instead of living on earth here is reluctance to action. Oftentimes when we have a moment to act, we're very quick to action. Someone says something to us that bothers us, we're very quick to defend ourselves or to stop that person from speaking. Someone says something to us about our family or our friends, or someone says something that's disagreeable to our morals. We're very quick to action. And oftentimes that quickness to action results in us breaking away from the mind of Christ and doing things on our own. And when we do things on our own, we do them, and not the Lord. If you're given the option of, who do you want to do this for you? Do you want some random human to have your back? Or do you want the King of Kings, the Lord of glory? And so as we see here, sometimes when we trust in the Lord and we're focused on above, our specific need for action can be delayed not by laziness, not by unwillingness to act, not by not wanting to get involved, but more so on letting the Lord do the work, letting the Lord guide our words and our thoughts and our actions, focused on the Lord Christ. And so this was a lesson for the disciples they didn't realize it yet because the Lord told them that he was sleeping. So they figured he's just going to go and wake him up so we can go at any time. Later on, the Lord even says, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. When they got there, not only was he not sleeping in the sense of the word, 
He had actually been dead for four days. And the disciples probably were stunned because they had seen the Lord many times make sick people well. They had also seen him raise people up from the dead, specifically probably twice. But in both of those instances, I think I said this last year too, both of those instances, he was not, the person that was raised had not been in the tomb for that long. Four days is a long time. When he gets there, Mary finds out, I'm sorry, Martha finds out, and she meets him away from the city of Bethany where he's going. And the first thing that she said to him was, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So again, focused on action, not focused on above. But even now, I know that whenever, whatever you ask of God, God will give you. So she corrected herself very suddenly. The presence of the Lord Christ in front of her obviously offered her some sort of comfort, some sort of excitement, some sort of knowledge that everything would be fine. The Lord even confirms that to her when he says, your brother will rise again. And she says to him, I know. I know that he will rise. I know this isn't the end. She says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She's very well read. The Lord says to her something, though, different, because he's speaking about now, rising up now, raising up this body now. He says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. It's not about if he will rise again. It's not about what will come. It's not about what I'm willing to do. It's way more than that. I am the actual resurrection and the life. In me is resurrection and life, he says to her. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And he says to her, do you believe this? And so filled with faith, she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. He had confirmed for her that he will raise up Lazarus from the dead. I think at that point she knew. And the reason I think that she knew is the next verse. She goes and she calls her sister and she sends for her. She says, come fast, hurry, come. Because Mary had stayed back. All this and the Lord still hadn't come into the town. Later on, they go to the tomb where Lazarus is. And now it's different. Mary meets them, Martha's there. The Jews that were there with them offering their condolences are also with them. And everybody's crying and sad and worried about the now, the current, not focused on what can come, but focused on earth. And it's a sad thing when someone dies. There's no escaping that. When someone is gone from our midst, there is nothing but mourning. And it's expected from us. We all do the same thing. We wear black. We call each other. We offer condolences. And so this moment changed again everything, brought everybody back down to earth, closed in on everybody in a negative way. And then the Lord stands up and says, take away the stone. And then Martha, who had earlier heard the Lord say, I am the resurrection and the life. She started to doubt and says, no, we can't remove the stone. He's been dead for four days. This is an embarrassment to us. We're going to smell the stench of death. But the Lord says to her something very poignant. He says, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? And when he says that reminder, she offered her faith again. And so the Lord did what no one expected, actually. He called for Lazarus as if calling for his friend who had literally been in the tomb sleeping. He called for him and he said, Lazarus, come forth with a loud voice so that he could hear him all the way in the depths of Hades. And his soul re-entered his body and he came back alive. So alive that he could barely walk because when they embalmed him, they embalmed a dead man 
not a live man, never expecting that this person would walk again. And so he comes out all wrapped up, and then the Lord even says, loose him. Khalas. He's alive again. Now we go to today's gospel, this evening's gospel. Theoretically, the way that it's presented is that this is the next day or later that day. Could have been weeks before, but what we know is six days before the Passover, six days before the Lord offering himself on the cross. Let's look at the figures and see where they are. Lazarus is sitting next to the Lord as a live man, given everything back again. And check where Mary is now. Whereas before, Mary was at home mourning and was slow to meet with Christ. Now, instead of serving, she sits at his feet. And because she has tasted from the Lord's faith and kept it now, she's focused on above, she learns a great secret. She learns that it is her responsibility to offer the first anointing to the Lord. And so she takes this oil of spikenard and breaks it and pours it on the feet of Jesus and wipes his feet with her hair. And it says here, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. St. Paul speaks of this focus on above multiple times. My two favorite of those verses, the first one is from Romans chapter 8, verse 5. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Check yourself, kiddo. Who, what are you thinking about? But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded, meaning to focus on the earth, and its worries, and food, and drink, and where, and why, and what, is death. But to be spiritually minded, focusing on Christ, and glory, and resurrection, and forgiveness, and faith, and love, and camaraderie, is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Can you believe that? The carnal mind like thinking of the worldly things, is against the thoughts of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. When the Lord came to Bethany, and Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She was saying the truth, probably that is true. He wouldn't have died if he was there. But she was focused on the carnal focused on what can't be done, what is impossible, what is beyond comprehension, beyond understanding, and therefore didn't see that the Lord Christ can do even the impossible. And so later when she learned that, she immediately changed her ways. There's another verse from the epistle to the Colossians, chapter 3 in the beginning. If then you were raised with Christ, like after baptism, we died in baptism and were raised up in the resurrection with Christ. When Abuna pulls us out of the water, it's as if we're rising with him. Seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ, in God. We died when we were baptized. We put away the old man and put on the new man in resurrection with Christ. We no longer need to worry about the things on the earth anymore. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is a promise. So given this now, in conclusion, imagine if you focused this week only on Christ, if you opened up your mind to the idea that the impossible actually is possible, 
that whatever your heart desires, he may give you, that whatever peace you want in your heart, you may be granted it, whatever love you wish to pursue, you may be given. If you focus this week on the Lord Christ and on heavenly things, and on, like St. Paul says, on Christ crucified, then you will see the results of your care and the results of your focus on him. But if you focus on the earthly things, all the good of Holy Week will be stripped from you very easily. It's happened so often, so many times. So be aware. That's why we turn off our TVs, we turn off our radios, we stop talking about things that mean nothing, we stop listening to things that are not of Christ. We stop reading things that are pointless. Shut off the news already. Shut off your televisions. Turn them on only if you're not coming to the Beth at night. And join with the church. Pray together. If we can offer our Lord our full faith and our full trust in him, anything that we want can happen. <clears throat> all the peace that we need can reside within us. We can finally be free from the cares of this idle world. Let's do it all together, and let's encourage each other with love to focus on the Lord Christ this week so that we also as a church, as one family, can see the glorious resurrection in a new light, a light which encourages us and takes us away from the fear of this world into the joy of our Savior. And glory be to our God. <clears throat> Amen.